Right, good evening everyone. My name is Dr. Jenny Krestov. I am one of the astronomers at Glendale Community College and I want to welcome you this evening to our virtual field trip to the stars, um, as well as the moon and Mars and a few other non-stellar uh, objects. So I am very pleased that you guys are here. This is really the first of the virtual field trips for the spring semester. Um, GCC, Glendale Community College's spring semester started today. So we're expecting uh, quite a few college students to join in, but this is also a virtual field trip that is put on in conjunction with the Glendale Community College Science Center Outreach Program. Um, I am very pleased to be working with some other scientists to um, offer field trips. Typically, we get thousands of K to 12 um, students through our doors every academic year, except this year, because pandemic. Um, so in lieu of students coming to us, we are trying to bring the night sky and some science to you guys um, in this online format. So I am joined here tonight by Dr. Christopher Burns, who's an astrophysicist at the Carnegie Observatories. And he is setting up a few things, but if you want to come over, you can say hi. And you will notice that I'm not wearing a mask around Chris. <laughs> Chris is my husband, so we we're in the same social bubble. But we're also joined this evening by Mr. Tom Meneghini, who is the executive director of Mount Wilson. So you will see him later this evening. So he is um, not in our family bubble, so if you see me wear my mask, it is because Tom is nearby. And we want to make sure that everyone up here is suitably safe. Um, so there's three of us. Um, we may be joined by a couple more astronomers later in the evening because we are at one of the most famous telescopes in the world. This is the historic 60-inch telescope on Mount Wilson. And let me just give you a sneak peek of that. There we go. So now you can see I'm sitting over here on your right-hand side in the black hat in the burgundy jacket. Um, Chris is in the bright blue jacket. And then Tom is standing over there by the yellow ladder and this giant blue thing is the telescope now it's not 60 inches long it's actually the the tube which is really just a scaffolding is 60 inches in diameter and we call it the 60 inch telescope because the mirror that collects the light for us is 60 inches in diameter so chris if you want to grab the roving camera we can go and have a look at the actual mirror um, or the base of the mirror. And so I'm going to move over to the mobile view. OK, whoop. All right. So this is the telescope.
There. Okay. There we go. Technical difficulties, I apologize. That's particularly frustrating. Um, we are seeing the feed from the mobile camera perfectly well, except you're not seeing it. Um, so we can see it on our different software programs, but you guys aren't seeing that, and that's frustrating. Um, but I'll go back to the dome view. Afterwards, but for now, I think we should just... And <laughs> Chris, you want to go stand over by it? All right, I'm just <laughs> We'll show you where the actual mirror is housed. Commentary. Here we go. All right. So, Chris's wingspan, arm span is about 60 inches, and the base of the telescope, that is where the mirror actually is. So, light comes from distant celestial objects, um, which shine out in all directions. Some of that light comes down toward the mirror, and the mirror is curved in such a way that it reflects it. Um, out the side where we have a camera. And the camera, shone on by a little green light, I don't know if you can see that up there, a little green laser pointer, but there's a, a little red thing um, that, Chris, you wanna put your hand on the camera or very close to the camera? This is where the special fancy telescope camera is and that is what is capturing the feed. Now, I'm just gonna go straight on over to the feed because that's really what you're here to see, not me, not necessarily the telescope, but the celestial objects. So, <clears throat> our first celestial object for the evening is our closest celestial neighbor, and that, of course, is the moon. So this is a very zoomed-in version of the moon, and I think we were trying to figure out which of the craters it was that we were looking at. Yeah, we'll bring it back to the center. And I will find... The telescope camera does pick up the light um, from the moon, the reflected sunlight, in three, using three filters, red, green, and blue. And so if you see it turn particularly red or particularly greenish or bluish, that's one of the filters that for some reason is defaulting and sending more signal to our feed. But this is a lovely crater. Um, craters on the moon, in fact craters on all solid planetary surfaces, are caused when an impact from outer space, um, or when an object from outer space impacts that solid surface. And so this particular one that we are looking at is called Langrenus. And what can we say about Langrenus? You can say it's 132 kilometers across. Oh, it's 132 kilometers across. Where's the information? Well, the information for what it is is there. So we have on our fabulous little cell phone, there's an app called Sky Safari. And you can zoom in to areas on the moon or areas on Mars and get information. Because there are thousands of craters on the moon and no one person is gonna have memorized all of the information for all of those. So this is called Langrenus. Um, I'm not sure if that's the correct pronunciation. It's a feature on the moon, it's a crater, and it's 132 kilometers in diameter, which is probably on the order of about 85 miles in diameter. So it's a pretty big feature. Um, you'll notice that it has a central peak and often that happens, um, <laughs> often that happens uh, if it's quite a large crater, which at 132 kilometers it is, but um, the impact is so energetic that it um, can liquefy the rock at the impact site, and the central peak is literally kind of the rock kind of rebounding, right? I think Newton had a famous law about for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction, so rock goes down and then it rebounds up. Um, and this is the central peak. So the larger craters will have a central peak to them. Um, smaller craters often will not. And there are some craters that have actually a peak and then an inner ring, and then the rim on the outside, which is pretty interesting. <laughs> okay, so we have a question on the YouTube live feed, as someone just pointed out. Um, 
So is this the camera that's blurry or the telescope? This is neither the camera nor the telescope. The telescope is an amazing piece of equipment and the camera also really cool. So what you're seeing in the blurring effect is actually caused by the Earth's atmosphere. So you'll see that the moon seems to be shifting around a little bit. So the camera's refresh rate is half a second? Oh uh, no. It's like... Five one thousandths of yeah. a second. Um, so it's very fast, but you can see that the moon does seem to shift position and it gets almost um, more blurry and then less blurry or with more of a crisp appearance. And that has everything to do with the turbulence of the atmosphere of the Earth. So the moon doesn't have an atmosphere, so there's no blurring there. But if you've ever gone out on a lovely clear night and looked up at the stars and the stars are twinkling beautifully, um, that's actually just the turbulent Earth's atmosphere that's causing those effects. Um, the stars themselves don't twinkle. That's just our perception of them living here on the Earth. Um, atmos the, the astronauts, when they go into outer space and they look at the stars, there is no twinkling. And the astronauts, when they went to the moon and they looked at the stars, there was no twinkling or scintillation. Um, there was just crisp, steady images. But some nights, oh, there you can see we have the red filter that just uh, exploded a little bit in our faces. Um, some nights you have better atmospheric seeing and some nights you have really terrible seeing. So um, I think they did a test live stream on Sunday from this very telescope using the same camera and on Sunday night a couple nights ago and it was pretty bad. They were looking at Mars and it just looked like an orange blob moving around the screen. So we're seeing the crater and that's pretty good. You know, I'm wondering if the yellow we cast is these lights that we have on in the dome. Well, I can turn them off. We can turn them off and see how that affects what we see of this crater. It's nice and dark in here now. It's, yeah, yeah, it's absolutely dark in here now. But it's still looking a little We all are sort of going down. In a, in yes. So the moon phase tonight is a um, waxing crescent. It's about 25% illumination. And I'm going to move over to a different view at the moment. So I'm going to move to <clears throat> a piece of software called Stellarium. And this is free, open source software. And what you're looking he at here is a view of our sky. Now this is a computer generated view of our sky. Um, and I can kind of grab with my mouse and pull it around. And usually astronomers by convention, by convention we look south. Um, and then we kind of have west to your right hand side and east to your left hand side. Here you can see the S on the horizon here, this kind of semicircle down at the bottom, which is a, um, a little difficult to see. That is the horizon. So down below that line we have Earth or ground, and above that we have the sky. So you can see the Milky Way here that's kind of bottom left up toward the center at the top. And then we have some stars and some groupings that are labeled. And I can zoom in just by scrolling with my mouse and we can see a very famous constellation. This is generally known, uh, known as Orion. We have Betelgeuse up here, kind of a reddish orange star. Rigel, um, sorry, down here, um, which is the left knee of Orion. Saif, and then Bellatrix, after whom Bellatrix Lestrange, or Lestrange is named if you like Harry Potter. And then we have Alnatak, Alnalam, and Mintaka, the three belt stars of Orion. We'll get to Orion in a little bit, but if I zoom out again, you'll see just over to the west, we have the moon. So I can actually click on the moon in this software and zoom in. Oh, hang on, double click. There we go, now it's centered, and now I can zoom in. And you can see this is pretty much the crescent, that if you went outside and looked up, this is what you'd see. Now, if you're joining us from the east coast of North America, and I know some of you are, welcome, um, the moon has already set for you. But here in California, the moon is still above the horizon, and we can see it. So we are seeing down here, 
Whoop. Pretty sure the crater that we were looking at is this crater right here. So if I go back to the actual attic view, the attic horizon to telescope camera. Oh, you're doing a moonwalk? Okay, well they're not on they're not on Langrinus Langrinus crater anymore. So one of the things about this camera is that it has an incredibly narrow field of view um, when you're looking at the moon. So we're not getting the entire moon as you may hope. So if I went back to Stellarium, this is a view kind of of the entire crescent moon. There, zoom out a little bit. Um, when you actually look at the view through the telescope, <laughs> just rotating the dome now, then you can see we're only looking at a very zoomed in chunk of that moon. So here's probably the bottom edge there. But this is a view of the moon. And you can see sometimes it's pretty blurry and then it comes in nice and crisply and sharply. There are some things we can do with this camera called stacking and you can actually take pictures and it will take a picture for five one thousandths of a second every second or so and then stack them. It discards those that are blurry and only keeps the most crisp um, and then it will stack them at the end so you get really um, high resolution images, but that's not what we're, we're doing tonight. We're having a live feed tonight. So this is what we're going to have a look at. So do you guys know where we are on the moon? Oh, I just found a nice crater. Oh, there's a nice crater. This yeah. little one over here. A little one over there. Um, I think these are kind of mountainous regions. Actually, I'm circling it with the mouse, but you guys can't see that on the YouTube. So. No. The mountainous <laughs> regions are what we're looking at right now, and then there's kind of a crater that looks weirdly like a circular U shape, kind of like a horseshoe. So it, it's just getting the light from the sun. It's a bagel. It's a bagel, <laughs> it's a bagel with a bite out of it, right? Let's see if I can find it in this. Oh, story. come on. Let's say donut. So I went. A little sweetness in our life. Now the moon we are looking at as the first target, our first celestial target for the evening, because it is pretty close to the western horizon. And it will set below what this telescope is capable of seeing. So the telescope can't look at things right on the horizon. It can go down to around 30 degrees above the horizon. Um, so we're gonna lose the moon from the telescope's field of view. And our next target is probably going to be Mars. So Just stay tuned us, for that. Let us know when you want us to head over to Mars. Head over to Mars. I think we can head over to Mars now. All right. Should we give it a go? You're the boss. <laughs> so I'm going to go back to the dome view. I'll bring the lights up. And Chris is going to turn the lights up. And we're going to shift some things around so you can see what's going on. So once we move from one target to a different target, obviously we have to move the telescope. And the telescope is um, controlled by, oh, I don't know if you can see, I'm trying to point to it with my finger. Right over here, there's a blue tarp. Under that tarp or behind that tarp is the telescope control panel, central region. And it's going to move, cause, you know, Tom's back there and he's going to move the telescope to relocate where it's pointing to point at Mars. Um, if Mars is over sufficiently, then we also have to rotate the dome so that the slit that is open, and I think you can see that, the telescope is looking at that dark patch of the sky. The inside of the dome is kind of a deep, red, rust colored. Um, the outside of the dome, of course, is painted the traditional white. 
Um, but we're going to move the telescope and move the dome and then have a look at what we can see of Mars. You want to see if we can fix the, uh, the roaming view? Yeah, let's view? see if we can fix the roaming view. Okay. Just, uh, can grab this for a sec? It's, like, completely gone. Yeah. Don't know what happened to it. No, it's, it's there. Oh, Zoom. it's, like, oh. tiny, tiny or something. Oh, yeah. you got to maximize that. I think we found the problem. Oh, right. Right. <laughs> I minimized the, the window. Uh, okay. How do I maximize it now? Is that it? Exit minimize view. All right. Well, it didn't seem to help, so let me try resizing it. It may have lost it. Let me try. Uh, try a different one, and then we'll go back to. There, there we, we go. go. Okay. Okay. Right. Yeah. And oh, it's too. Oh, now it's huge. Wow, that was very odd. But I don't. S it's it's because we minimize. It's because we minimize the window. Yeah. Oh, okay. This is so annoying to get. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this is truly bizarre. Is it Why resizing? Is... I think it's resizing. Okay, let me try this. Okay. Transform. Position. Whoa. Size. Yeah, that's... There's your problem. Let's make it 500. And then... 500? That's good to start. Yeah. Alright, now I can... that bit there we go i think we're almost there people <laughs> so the moral of the story is don't moral of the story is don't minimize the zoom okay. feed i think that's that's okay so we use the zoom um to be able to link the cell phone camera up to this system wirelessly so that Chris can take the cell phone camera anywhere in the dome, and then he can rove around the dome with it. Um, so if we go over to mobile view now, oh yeah, there's the telescope. Yay. All right, so if I go back to the dome view, you can see that the telescope has moved, and the dome, all that squeaking that you heard, was in fact the dome rotating. So we've moved the telescope, we've moved the dome, and Mars is there. Mars is there, but I don't know if it's in focus. So while the astronomers work on focusing the dome, what can I tell you about Mars? Um, it's the fourth planet out from the sun. It only has a, a diameter about half the diameter of Earth. And so all of these people who are like, yeah, we're going to colonize Mars, we're going to move, well, move to Mars, so. um, they don't realize that it would be actually quite so, different. There's so many ways it would be different than living on the Earth. But being only about a third of the mass of Earth and half the diameter, then you're not going to have the gravitational pull. So you're not going to be able to walk on Mars the way that you would walk on the Earth. So if you remember the videos of seeing the astronauts kind of bouncing around and jumping around on the moon, you would have to walk more in that type of fashion. Um, so that's kind of one of the, the really interesting things about Mars, is I think people view it as kind of being like a twin to the Earth in size and mass and things like that. Venus certainly is a twin to the Earth in size and mass not in environment, but Mars is really quite different. Um, it's the fourth planet out from the sun. It's about one and a half times the Earth's distance from the sun, um, out from the sun. So it is colder. I mean, the farther you get from your heat source, the colder it's going to be. Um, so there's that. To our knowledge, there is not life on Mars, nor 
do we have any ever any evidence that there ever was life on Mars? But stay tuned because on Thursday, two days from now, the Perseverance spacecraft, which launched about six months ago, is going to land on Mars or will attempt to land on Mars because you know sometimes landings don't go quite right. But um, Perseverance hopefully will land on Mars and it has on it instrumentation that will allow for a sample return. And if we actually get one of the Martian surface rock samples back to Earth, a bunch of different samples, then um, labs on Earth are so much more sophisticated and there's so much more instrumentation than labs on the actual spacecraft that land on Mars. So if we get sample return, we can have a much better look at um, the microscopic, you know, the microscopics, I suppose, or a much better, closer look at the, 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 um, the surface material of Mars to see if there ever, if there ever was life, if there are any signatures to show that there was life on Mars at any point in the past, because we're pretty sure there's not life there now. But then again, we haven't gone all over the planet, so we don't know for sure. Are we good? All right. Oh, as good as we're going to get. We got the thumbs up for Mars. So let's go back to our attic view. And there we have Mars. It's very red. Which is very red. I'll zoom in a bit. Chris will zoom in. The seeing, not the best. But there we have it. Yay. <laughs> Yes. So just like the moon and the phases we see of the moon, we see some phases of Mars. Now, we don't see all the phases, but we can definitely see it as a gibbous phase and a full phase. We'll never see it as a crescent phase because it's farther out from the sun than the Earth is. Um, but you can see that it's definitely not, well, now it's just dump, jumping around and it looks like a, a squash ball being deformed. But that is our neighboring planet. Um, at closest approach, it's a. Phew, at closest approach, it's about 75 million kilometers away. It is not at closest approach now. I would think it's it's definitely over 100 million kilometers away from us, and it's around 6,000 kilometers in diameter. So you're going to make me do the conversion. Scientists speak metric. I actually grew up with a metric system, so converting to miles is a bit of a challenge for me. So the closest it would ever get to us is around 48 million miles. It's not at closest approach right now, so we're probably over around 75 or 80 million miles at the moment, and it's only 4,000 miles across, so it's really, really far away for something as small as it is, and it's a testament to the amazing quality of the 60-inch telescope here at Mount Wilson that we can actually, you know, see it in the first place or see it so um, clearly. It's, I, I, I had that word at the tip of my tongue, and I'm like, but we're not really seeing it clearly. Is it clouding over again? Because it's definitely dimming down. It's okay, it's just you can hear the wind going, so uh, our, our atmosphere is a little uh, turbulent. However, it just occurred to me we could show the folks the picture that was taken here okay. previously. I think I can make this work. Okay. And this is using that technique you were talking about. Yep, so um, probably about a month ago now. Um, there were some astronomers up here using this camera and this telescope, and they use that technique of stacking um, short duration photographs. And this was actually posted on the Mount Wilson Facebook as well feed, but here you go. So this is actually a photograph, a compiled photograph, composite if you would, of Mars taken with this equipment. So this is what this equipment is capable of producing, but this is not what we're seeing tonight. So this is absolutely stunning. You can see the polar ice cap down there at the bottom of the planet. So we have um, an orangey, rusty colored planet 
and at the bottom there's a smidge of white and that is the polar ice cap. It's not water ice like we have at the poles here on Earth. It would be carbon dioxide ice. And then the darker areas, um, those are obviously different types of crustal material, rock, if you would, on Mars's surface. So hematite or hematite, however you want to pronounce it, I'm not a geologist, is kind of a grayish, uh, kind of a dark gray with a, a, a little tinge of blue to it. So that may be some of the rock, and that likely is some of the rock um, that we're seeing here with some of the, the features that are more prominent in the darker areas of this photograph. Um, Mars does have seasons, just like at the Earth. It rotates on its axis at uh, a tilt to the ecliptic, pretty much the same as the Earth. I think it's about 24 degrees. And so it has seasons. It has winters and summers, although being farther from the sun, the winters and summers are both cooler than the um, seasons we have here on the Earth. Um, and with the change in seasons, the atmosphere of Mars, more tenuous than the Earth's atmosphere for sure, but the atmosphere will heat up, will cool down, and you'll have the Martian surface heat up, and all of that heating and cooling creates winds. And you can have some pretty wicked windstorms on Mars. And some, t some years, those features that you're seeing here so clearly are much more obscured because the rock is covered with the very fine reddish-orange dust that comprises most of the um, Martian, I don't know if you'd really call it soil, because soil implies organic bits that you could grow your vegetables in. But um, I think there was a movie about growing potatoes in Mars. But this is um, quite a crisp image of Mars, and we are looking at the rock kind of scraped bare of all that red dust for which Mars is so famous. Did you point out where the rover's going? I did not point out okay. where the rover's going. So I can do that, I think. You need to be... There. I don't think you can do that Aww. on attic. You have to do it over there. I'm not on the attic. I'm on the... Yeah, I know, but if you do it over there... I am doing it over there. No, you're not. What? It's over on this oh, little screen over here. Is it, oh, you are. You're right. Oh, no, you can see it. All right, well... It is showing up. Okay, so... A little tiny mouse. It's in here. Right in there? That's where the, mo nice. the rover's going. Near this thing that looks like Africa. Upside down. Uh, that's... Really? I was about to say, that looks like Africa? To well, me, it upside. looks like Lake Huron, but... Yeah. <laughs> Near this Lake Huron feature, uh, that's where it's going. There's a crater down in here somewhere, and that's where, where it's going to land. Yeah. Perseverance. So, do you know what time on Thursday it's going to land? I do not. I should look that up. Yeah. You can probably look that okay. home, look that up at home. So. But Thursday, two days from now, right before my uh, astronomy lab class that I'll be teaching. So maybe we can watch it together if it, if it lands in the evening on West Coast time. But I don't know what Chris and Tom are off to do, because we are looking at Mars. But we can just gaze at this lovely view, or we can go back to the dome view, and you can have a look at what the telescope looks like in kind of the low light situation. Um, what else can I say about Mount Wilson? Prior to the pandemic, you could actually come and observe through an eyepiece on that telescope for yourself. Um, every semester, or almost every semester, I would bring an interested group of astronomers up here. They can fit 25 people into this dome. Um, and we could rent the dome for half night. And then you can, you and your 24 best friends, can have an evening here. Um, in the 60 inch and then look at different objects through the eyepiece that is bolted on to the telescope where the camera usually, or where the camera is right now. Um, if you've used telescope before, as you know, typically you use um, you know, a one and a quarter inch diameter eyepiece to look through when you're looking at a telescope. Sometimes you get big eyepieces, the two inch eyepieces, but we have a six inch eyepiece here at Mount Wilson to look through, which is crazy big. The first time I saw it, I'm like, whoa, this is, this is specially made. 
especially made for the 60 inch. Ooh, I'm looking right through the dome and I know you won't be able to see it because it's not gonna come through on our cameras, but I'm seeing stars up there. And I'm gonna go out on a limb and say I see Beetlejuice and Bellatrix and Aldebaran, which I happen to know are three stars that are pretty much high overhead. If we go back to Stellarium, I can show that to you. So we're back at the moon. Let's zoom out of the moon on Stellarium. And it's just gonna become a sprite. And then if we're facing south, which we pretty much are, I mean, this you can kind of get the full on view of the entire sky. So it's like lying on your back looking up with a fisheye lens. But pretty much due south, whoa, is going to be Aldebaran and then Betelgeuse and Bellatrix. So I'm seeing these three stars above my location right here through the strip of the dome that is open where I can actually see. So that's kind of fun. So I know that um, one of the targets we're going to look at later tonight is in fact the Orion Nebula. That's I think what we're gonna go do next. We're trying to find something that won't put us in the wind. Oh, in the wind. Is the wind becoming a real problem? Can you hear it? Yeah, I can hear the wind. I don't know if you guys can hear the wind. Hey, you two, do you want to put in a chat? Can you guys hear the wind? And we'll see if, um, if the, the microphone picks it up. In all honesty, to me, it kind of sounds like traffic, but that's the wind. So we are gonna look at the Orion Nebula. So these are Alnitak, Alnilam, Mintaka, the three bright belt stars. Below the belt stars of Orion, there appear to be three more stars, and they're much more faint. But this central star-like object is in fact not a star. That is the famous Orion Nebula. So if we zoom in here, Oh. Why am I not finding the Orion's Nebula? Just keep going. Keep Just going. keep going. Oh. Yeah. Ooh, that's weird. That is so weird. In Stellarium, is I'm it, like, where you is to, it? You need to turn it on or something. Do I need to turn on deep sky objects? Yeah, try that one. Little galaxy. No. Oh, Great Orion Nebula. There it is. Yeah, but no, you should see more than that. I know. We should totally see more than that. setting in, in Stellarium. Clearly, I have not turned on the, the right software package in Stellarium to show the Great Orion Nebula because I'm like, what happened? Should be uh, seeing that for sure. Oh, joy. So this is deep sky objects. It would be considered a deep sky object. So it is turned on. And you can see double wedge cluster, and GC 2215. By the way, for those new to astronomy, you'll see a lot of NGC numbers. So this is NGC uh, 2215, NGC 2286. NGC stands for the New General Catalog. New as of 1888. So um, I would think we should rename that, but you know, no one ever listens to me. So we've got the dome rotating. I'm sure you can hear that. Although I'm not sure you can see anything if I go back to the dome view. Oh, yep. I've turned the lights down. I don't know if you can even see me. Oh, roughly. <laughs> the poor light. No, the light's down is okay. No one needs to see me anyway. Um, but the dome would be nice to be able to see. Um, we'll go back to Stellarium and see Beetlejuice. Um, and Orion. One of the things that I am super interested in is constellation lore. So here we have um, a very famous constellation. In Greco-Roman mythology, this is Orion. In Armenian mythology, this is Hike, who is also a mighty warrior. Um, Orion's head is up here, this quite faint star. This is the star Misa which looks faint to us, but is in fact an incredibly bright star. Just happens to be really far away. 
Then we've got Betelgeuse, Bellatrix, Rigel and Scythe. So these are the shoulder stars of our mighty warrior. And then the belt and then his knees. And I do believe I can put up some artwork here. Constellation art. So you can kind of see Orion. Ooh, he's got a lion draped over his arm. That seems to me like a lion skin. But he is um, fighting Taurus the bull over here. Um, Aldebaran is known as the Eye of the Bull, although that is not what the name Aldebaran actually means. And the Pleiades cluster, the Pleiades cluster, is high atop um, Orion or uh, Taurus's shoulder. Um, there are many constellations, as you can see here. Um, Monoceros, the unicorn, to my knowledge, not a rainbow unicorn. We have Procyon, which is the brightest star in Canis Minor, the small dog. Sirius is the brightest star in Canis Major. And the three belt stars of Orion point over here to Sirius. In one direction, the other direction, they point up to Aldebaran. My personal favorite constellation is Triangulum because three stars making a triangle is something that my limited imagination can actually pick out. Um, not so good seeing like a Medusa's head full of snakes, but um, this is Orion. In different cultures, you have different imaginings of what this, you know, a particular grouping of stars would actually represent. And there is a really neat website, website called Figures in the Sky that shows, I believe there are about 21 different cultures, sky cultures, and what they um, envision in these stars. Not all of them group these particular stars together because it very much depends on your imagination or what culture you're looking at. Um, but many of them uh, have Betelgeuse as a prominent star. It is one of the brightest stars in the sky, and Sirius, Betelgeuse, Aldebaran, that kind of, those three. Um, a lot of cultures combine those three and tell stories about those three. And the Pleiades is also a very famous group of stars here, known as the Seven Sisters. There are, in fact, only six bright stars, although if you look at it through a small telescope, like this view would give us, we've got about 30 stars. stars. Are we ready? Uh, we're just hunting for it. <laughs> oh, we're hunting we, for uh, the, Orion the Orion Nebula. It's, it's so big, it's hard to find. Yes, one of the things is the field of view of our telescope is, as you saw with the moon, so small. It's so narrow a field of view that um, the Orion Nebula which is really big. I mean, you're, you've got to search for the, the trapezium or something at the center of the Orion Nebula. I really wish I could get that here in um, Stellarium. We've got the ground, we've got cardinal points, we've got the atmosphere, deep sky objects. Um, wonder if we could let's use the search window and look for it. It's M45, right, Chris? M42. 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 Oh, not 442. M42. Let's have a look at that. Whoa. Yeah, it says it's there, but I'm not seeing it. So I don't know if there's a software filter or add on or package that we're missing oh, from here. There you go. Oh, <laughs> you've got it in the real. It's coming in, yeah. The real telescope? Yeah, if you want to switch over, you can. Yes, I will absolutely switch over to the Proof view to everyone that through we the telescope. Are moving there we go. The sky. Oh, there's the trapezium in Isn't the upper it? right oh. corner, which is four very bright, newly formed stars that are kind of in a trapezoidal configuration. Trapezoid? Called the All trapezium. Right. Do you wish to try and focus? <laughs> okay. Right, right. So Tom is going to attempt to focus the telescope or focus the camera. Focus the telescope so that the camera has a clear view of the stars. But. Oh, that's better. Yeah. 
because there's the delay between sure. what we see on yeah. the monitors or what Tom does with the focusing and then what we see on the monitors, he can kind of go past the point of focus and then okay. you have I'll to kind of the retreat. Color on. Here comes color. Oh, color? While we were binning. So. Oh, okay. So um, the Great Orion Nebula is a giant cloud of gas and dust. That's pretty much what a nebula is. Um, given that 80% of the atoms of the universe are hydrogen atoms, um, you will see a lot of red in nebulae because nebulae being the plural of nebula, because hydrogen tends to glow red. Different atoms will grow, glow different colors, and now I'm getting tongue-tied. It is cold in here, and the colder I get, the more my tongue does not want to move to make the right words. So excuse me if I'm sounding a little slurred. I've just been drinking hot chocolate this evening, but the cold is getting to me. Um, it is probably, what, just hovering above freezing? I yeah. think it's... Uh, a little more? I think it's about 30. Didn't you have a, I thought we had a thermometer somewhere. We did have a thermometer, but 36, I have no idea. 36 degrees. 36 degrees. So it's about, what, 4 degrees centigrade? That's just, that's summer. Oh, my goodness. Sometimes you can't even tell them apart. Yeah. Oh, my. Anyway, the, high, the gas um, of this nebula shows a lot of red color because there's a lot of hydrogen there. So we get different, or we get light emitted from these gases because these gases are energized by bright nearby stars, such as these four stars of the tra trapezium. And prominently, the ultraviolet light will interact with the atoms and cause the electrons that orbit the nucleus of the atom to kind of pop up to a higher orbital, higher electron orbital. And that's what happens when the atom absorbs the energy from these uh, hot nearby stars. And then over time, the atoms kind of lose the energy, de-excite, and the electron will transition back down toward the nucleus. But it can't, like, take, it can't just, it has to absorb at particular, uh, particular colors or particular wavelengths, and it emits at those same colors. Um, so the brightest color that hydrogen can emit in the visible portion of the electromagnetic spectrum is, or the most intense color, is the red. So it's at 656 um, nanometer wavelength, uh, for those of you who like this type of thing. And there's also three other visible wavelengths that are emitted by hydrogen. I think one at 484, and then like three, no, 434, and then 410, I think, are the wavelengths um, in nanometers that uh, hydrogen emits at. But the brightest is the red, and that's the color that you're seeing here. So in the YouTube stream, it kind of looks a little bit pinkish. The brightest area is kind of down and a little to the left of the four bright stars. Um, but that's what we're getting. If there's other colors that you see um, in nebula, especially if you go online and you just Google nebula and you get all these wonderful Hubble Space Telescope images, you're gonna have the red, um, which is hydrogen. The yellowy peachy color, that's helium, which is the second most common element or type of atom in the universe. And often there's a little bit of um, blue or green as well, and that will be oxygen. Um, there are different types of nebula. The ones that glow pretty colors are either emission nebula. If you see a lot of blue, that's a reflection nebula. And that's actually not caused by gas, that's caused by dust. So these huge nebula are clouds of gas and dust. But there's a lot of dust there. Um, the dust is usually very, very small particles. Um, and it preferentially reflects blue light in our direction over the other colors of light. So if you see um, blue and often around, if you see, you know, if you go and Google a picture of the Pleiades cluster, then you will see it surround a kind of like blue glow. That is a cloud of dust that those stars are traveling through at this point. So I had always thought that was 
some of the cloud of dust left over from which those stars of the Pleiades formed, but that I found out a couple months ago is not the case. It's actually the, that cluster of stars are moving through space together and they encountered a cloud of, of dust and um, that dust is now reflecting blue light from those stars in our direction. So the Pleiades cluster looks like it's surrounded by blue fuzz, which is the reflection nebula. So I thought we could have a little a bit of a learning experience here. Ooh, bring it on. <laughs> well, so uh, we often use this term called seeing in astronomy. And tonight is pretty bad seeing. Uh, and it's often measured in an angle. And because we're dealing with such small angles on the sky, uh, so if we try to measure the, uh, the distance between the stars as they appear on this image, we would say that they're a certain number of arc seconds away from each other. And if you've been watching, you may have noticed that there are times when the seeing is so bad that all four of the trapezium kind of just blend together, like kind of like now. <laughs> or I don't know if now is now. We have a delay on YouTube. but Yeah, but it's a video and audio delay at the same time. Okay, well, that was now. And so when two stars are close enough and the resolution of the telescope and the seeing of the night is poor enough that you can't distinguish them then you would say you can't resolve them, you cannot split them. And that gives you an idea of what the uh, seeing is. So if the seeing is like two arc seconds and an arc second is one three hundred, one three thousand six hundredth of a degree, if the uh, seeing is one arc second, that means if two stars are separated by just an arc second, you can tell them apart. Now, these stars are many arc seconds apart from each other. Oh dear. And there are some times <laughs> where we cannot even distinguish one from the other because they kind of blend together. So the seeing tonight is, I, I don't even, I'm, it'd be nice to guess. I'd love to know how far apart these stars are, but sky so far Crappy, is not, not I think is the word you're looking for. It. It's, it's terrible. <laughs> this is really bad. I think that's still an okay word to use, <laughs> live streaming. Um, yeah, it's not good. And for those of you who heard me talk about atmospheric seeing or the atmospheric blurring, oh, wow, that was just a really bad. Chris, it looks like Mickey Mouse. It's just, yeah, this, the atmosphere wow. is all over the place tonight. So it's the, the, the seeing that he's talking about is that blurring effect of the atmosphere. Astronomers call it atmospheric seeing or just seeing for short. And the arc seconds that he's talking about are subdivisions of a degree. Now you guys probably remember back from middle school that there are 360 degrees in a circle. Astronomers divide everything we can see in the sky kind of by 360 degrees, but with the horizon, a perfectly flat horizon from one horizon, like in the east, directly overhead down to the west, that's gonna be 180 degrees. So each degree is divided into arc minutes. There are 60 arc minutes in each degree of arc. And each arc minute is further divided into 60 arc seconds. So in fact, 60 times 60, you got 3,600 arc seconds in every degree. And to give you an idea of how small an arc, hang on, an arc degree is, or a degree of arc, if you hold your pinky finger up at arm's length, and I'm actually gonna go back over to the webcam view here. You can see me hold my pinky finger up at arm's length. Your pinky finger diameter is gonna subtend two degrees. So that would be 7,200 arc seconds in the width of your pinky finger held at arm's length. Now, some of you have bigger pinky fingers, but if you have a bigger pinky finger, you probably have a longer arm. So it should work more or less equally well for everybody. So if you imagine kind of how much of the sky you can block out with your pinky finger held at arm's length, across the diameter of your pinky finger, that's gonna be 7,200 degrees of arc. And some telescopes have sub arc second seeing or resolution capabilities. So if the atmosphere is still enough and isn't like waving, you know, I don't know if you've ever looked at the bottom of a pool and if no one's swimming in the pool and the water's very still and there's like a penny sitting on the bottom, you could probably figure out it's a coin. You might not know it's a penny, but it's round and it's small and you'd probably figure it out. But if you have a whole bunch of people swimming around in the pool and that water, which is generally clear, 
is shifting around. You're like looking at the bottom going, I don't even know if there's a penny there. It's just, there's so much turbulence in the water. Well, we have a good hundred kilometers of atmosphere above our heads that the light from the stars has to tra travel through to get to us. And all of this atmospheric seeing, the air acts like the water in the pool does. Um, and it blurs our image. So if we go back over here to the attic view, Yeah, actually, oh no, there it goes. It's, um, it's not great. So what is the actual separation, angular separation or, of two of these stars? You said up sub arc. 0 0.3 arc minutes. 0 0.3 arc minutes. Yeah. So, so a third of an arc minute, so yeah. around 20 arc seconds. We are seeing was at 20 arc seconds at one point. Wow, that really is terrible. That is terrible. <laughs> because we can, if on a nice clear night where the sky is very steady and there's no wind, we can see down that with such clarity and such high resolution. But yeah, we're not getting that tonight. I'm good. Which is disappointing. So we could try. To be sure. We could try uh, Cleopatra's eye. Okay. I mean, usually I'd say, well, it's it's low, so the the scene would be great, but the scene's so bad. We might as well give so it a bad. shot. Okay, we're gonna go to a planetary nebula, known as Cleopatra's eye. It's not on there. I, I messed up. And it's on not list. on our cheat sheet. All right. I call. I I thought it was the the. Uh, Cat eye nebula. Cat eye nebula. That so is Cleopatra's. I Nebula in Eridanus? No. Let's find let's find it. Alright. Um if you have the NGC number or the um, Messier number, let's just see we it. can find it in Stellarium. Let's go back over to Stellarium. Let's zoom out here. Turn off the deep sky objects. Zoom in a little bit. I'll get the NGC. And then search for. Well, I'm just going to search for Cleopatra. Oh, my fingers are not going to work here on the keyboard. I have a sneaking suspicion. Oh, Cle oh death. Cleo. Ah, oh, Cleopatra's Eye Nebula. Thank you, Stellarium, for finding it for me. All right. So it is just drawing a line from Beetlejuice down to Rigel and then swinging off to the right a little bit in the same part of the sky. Um, in fact, let us make an estimation about which constellation it's in. Oh, I can tell you. I have no idea. It is in... Put on some artwork. Oh, it is in there. Oh, Serpens. Eridanus? Eridanus. Is yep. Eridanus a serpent? Because this sure as heck to me looks like a serpent. Uh, maybe a sea serpent. Wait. Is that a stove? Are you telling me two stars and somebody envisioned a stove? Well, you know, those southern southern constellations oh. are kind of okay. weird sometimes. Okay, so let's turn off the artwork and the constellations, and then let's zoom in to Cleopatra's. Well, you're not going to probably see anything, because for some reason, Stellarium doesn't like yeah, showing. Yeah, Stellarium doesn't like our... Yeah, it's not giving us anything for... Mwah. All right, so we are going to go to the real view... Um, but there's nothing there right now. If I go to the dome view, I can turn the lights on. You can see us here in the dome, or not, as the case may be, because the lights are on. <coughs> Excuse me, the lights are not on, and um, oh, they're they're coming on. Alrighty, it's chilly in here. <laughs> um, so we have the telescope which is pointing, I don't know if you can see this well, but it's pointing a little lower oh. toward the horizon. And Chris is going to turn the other lights on. Oh, Turn on the bright ones and then we destroy our night vision. Not that we have much of it. But you can see that our telescope has moved. It's pointing a little further down toward the horizon um, to where Cleopatra's eye nebula is. Now, Cleopatra's Eye Nebula is a planetary nebula, and it is, uh, I guess, yep, 
right, we gotta to really anthropomorphize it, it is the kind of dying gasp of a medium mass star like the sun. So, <coughs> stars go through evolutionary stages. Stars form from these huge clouds of gas and dust, these nebula. Um, and the fuel that stars have that creates the light and the energy and the heat um, is the hydrogen atoms. And through a process of nuclear fusion, the hydrogen fuses to make helium. And when it does that, it gives off energy. And that comes out as heat and light and other types of electromagnetic radiation. Um, but eventually, stars use up all their fuel. And when you don't have any more fuel left, you know, the star goes out, so to speak. But it goes out in different ways, depending on the mass. So a medium mass star, and our sun is a medium mass star, so we have a great example in our local neighborhood. They use up all the nuclear fuel. The hydrogen in the core fuses into helium. Helium can fuse um, into carbon and oxygen, but they, it can't go beyond that. In order to fuse heavier elements, you would need a hotter temperature. Um, to fuse into carbon and oxygen, I think you think need 600 million degrees Kelvin in the core of a star, which is produced by the weight of the overlying material, so kind of the outer atmospheres of the star. And gravity pulls everything together, and that gravitational force creates pressure at the core, and you increase the pressure, you increase the temperature, that's, you know, basic chemistry if you've done the ideal gas law, PV equals NRT. And in a medium mass star, you simply don't have the mass to create the pressure to drive the temperature high enough to fuse anything we're there, past carbon. Uh, and we're going to turn Ooh off the lights because this thing's super dim. Okay. So we have to turn off all of, I, do I turn well, off my monitors? Well, no, I don't have to. Close my laptop. Let's go back to the attic view. Ooh, there we go. So what you're seeing here is kind of the last, last, I knew my tongue was just not going to work in the cold, last gasp of a dying okay, medium mass better. star. Right. So you can see um, a white dwarf in the center that is left over of the core of the medium mass star and surrounding it there is a ring. And this is when the, the, the winds from the core have kind of blown off, blown out the outer atmospheres. It's not actually a ring, it's a bubble. But the front and the back of the bubble are pretty thin. So you're seeing kind of the sides of the bubble where there's a lot more kind of material from in our line of sight to see it. So this is quite a faint planetary nebula. Um, so known as Cleopatra's eye. Can we kind of see a color? I don't know. I'm going to start binning up the pixels so that maybe we get a bit more sensitivity. Yeah. Since I'm thinking I'm colors. seeing kind of a greenish blue. What are All you right. thinking of you're seeing? Well, we'll, we'll call it we'll call it what we've seen the color and now we'll bin the pixels <laughs> and we'll lose the color and let's try four. See what that gets us. you're probably seeing it a bit better. Yeah. And I'm going to go all the way to five seconds. And this will get really bright. I'll adjust it when it does. Okay. Yeah. So one of the interesting things with this camera is that we have software that will allow us to change the exposure rate and um, the equivalent of the ISO a regular camera. So I can almost see it. I don't know if you can see it. There. Yeah, you can almost see it. There's actually two shells around this nebula. Huh? The inner shell we were seeing pretty clearly, and there's yeah. a star to the upper left that another shell kind of it goes out that far. Yep. And maybe when the 
you know, if the sky steadies down yeah, just a little I, bit. Yeah, I saw it a little bit, and then it kind of disappeared. So is that other star, I would imagine, a background star or a foreground star? I don't know. It's hard to know. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's one of the things in astronomy that is the hardest to determine is distance to these objects. Some planetary nebula are larger than other planetary nebula. So if you see one that is, you know, physically bigger, a little brighter, it's natural to assume that it's closer to us, but maybe it's not. Maybe it's just like a giant planetary nebula that's really bright, but farther than some others. So it's a challenge. There are many methods that astronomers use to determine distance, but planetary nebula, um, notoriously difficult to determine distance to. I'm gonna go to 10 seconds. Oh, we're just living dangerously. What, just to see what we can see. 12, 12. oh my gosh. Now, don't get crazy. <laughs> okay, so. Oh, the cold is settling in. <laughs> sunset about an hour and a half ago. I really want to see that other shell, but... And I know the East Coast you is, you know, there. most of the country is in deep freeze under a lot of snow at the moment, and I do feel for you, but you're probably not sitting outside, not moving, and just staring at a screen at the moment. There may be some crazy astronomers who are doing that. I wouldn't put it past them. But, uh... Pretty cold sitting here in almost zero degrees. All right. Uh, what else do you want to look at? We could look at a double star, I guess. Oh, we could look at a double star? Uh, Gamma Andromeda. It's got a nice double colors. Yeah. It's still, Gamma Andromeda it's still, is uh, technically a triple star system, I think. Uh, actually, it technically is a quadruple. Gamma Andromeda is obviously in the constellation of Andromeda, and we can go and look for that in Stellarium. Um, we're going to have to zoom out from what would have been, oh my gosh, where's Stellarium? Zoom out from what would have been Cleopatra's eye if we had the right Stellarium package. And I'm going to go down here and turn off the deep sky objects. And we want to find, let's see if we can find Gamma Andromeda. Gamma and, oh, 57 and. Oh, we're not going to see this either. But this is Almach. Almach is a star. Well, yeah, duh. Gamma Andromeda is um, going to be a double star, which I don't think this one, oh, is it? Yes, it is showing that it is a double star system. So we may very well see it like this with the seeing that we're having this evening. But we have, um, I think it's a triple system. I think one of these is not an optical double. You can't see that it's a double star. But you can tell if you take a spectral analysis of the light we get from this double system. So one of them's double system. Maybe it's this one. Maybe it's this one. And then the other is a single star. But these two that you are seeing um, that look like individual stars, they are orbiting a common center of mass. So they're kind of doing a, a, a dance around one another, around their common center of mass. And the neat thing about these two stars is you can see the distinct colors. One is a golden color and the other one is kind of the white blue of those new xenon headlights. Um, but yeah, if you're just looking at, at it, at that star with the naked eye, then A, it's not a particularly bright star, although you can still see it. But it is, uh, it is, it just looks to your eyes like a single star. Now, I just noted that Mars is over here. We'll go in and have a look at Mars. This is what Mars should have looked like if you had perfect seeing. 
this is going to be a computer rendered um, image that's going to be Valis Marineris. So we know that Valis Marineris would be facing us this evening. Um, and then Olympus Mons, I think, is this one right here. It is the biggest mountain, biggest volcano in the solar system. So just FYI. No, hang on. Never mind. It's over here. Wrong side. Uh, yeah, no. This one is Olympus Mons there. So Gamma Andromeda is a little further, a little too far out of reach. So we're going to go oh, for another triple star system. Okay. Although... I don't know if we'll be able to see it, but try. Yeah, I noticed Gamma's, Gamma Andromeda was like way down here. Triple? Yeah, why not? Probably Uranus probably. is also above the horizon. Um, so you can see it if you had another smaller telescope set up, but we can't. It's too far. Oh, wait, hang on. No, I don't think it is. Oh, I am so messed up. Which way are we looking? Okay, that way. Nope. I don't know if we could try Uranus later on as well. Or is it too far below? It's the altitude. Uh, oh, I turned the time off. It still thinks it's... Um, yeah. Uh, how do I go now? Time window, location window. Let's go... 7.44. Wait, what? It's 7.13. Wait, that's date. What? Okay. Come on. If I... I'm going to turn the lights up. Get to the right so date and time, the... and then we click on Uranus. Um... Oops. It is field of um I don't know what it is. Where does it say what it is? Uh, we get close enough? Click, click. No, that's not right. I don't know what it's well, I'll um, do it. I'll do it with here, but if you wanna Turn the dome view on. I can turn the lights on. Okay, dome view. Let's go back to dome view. So our list of targets that we had beautifully set up for the evening, we are having to change because um, got a little windy, so we had to look in a different direction than we had anticipated looking in. So the I will let you know that the forecast, I was looking at it all weekend, the forecast for tonight was clear and beautiful and perfect, and then earlier today it was cloudy. So, you know, forecasts are good to a point. They're not perfect. As the weather people will tell you. All right. Is it too far over for hours, Uranus? Yeah, oh yeah. Sorry guys, we can't see Uranus tonight. <laughs> okay, we're there, so turn the lights off. That looks like serious. Turn the lights off. Oh, we're not seeing anything in the attic view. Well, we're just getting blown out because oh. we're still moving, as you can see. Yep. So while well, you can't hear the telescope moving, it is still moving. Um, when you move the telescope slowly, that process is called slewing. And it's a quite a slow movement. It takes um, up to a minute or two for the telescope to finally get to its um, coordinates or the coordinates of the object that it's um, pointed at. But you can see here there are kind of streaks that seem to be going left and right. Or, whoa. There we go. That was really bright. That's it. That's the one. Okay, then. So this is, what are we looking at? This is Beta Mon. Beta Monoceros. Beta, oh, Monoceros. Okay, so we are in the constellation of the Unicorn. Oh, hey, I can see three. Beta, Beta Mon. Beta Monoceros. 
Let's turn on color. I don't know if these guys actually have color in it. I don't know. Nice shooting, Tex. Okay. So, what do you got there? Okay, I'm just gonna quickly flip over to Stellarium while you focus and stuff. So we are in the constellation of Monoceros, or Monoceros. Again, I don't speak ancient Greek, so I'm not quite sure. Oh, we're right at the hoof of the unicorn. Maybe that, that star actually signifies the hoof. But that's where we're going. Sorry? So we're gonna zoom in, do, yes. and zoom in, uh, and focus? zoom so, in, and <laughs> zoom in. Right, and you will, can see uh, I will it that you. it's not star-shaped anymore. It breaks into two, and this one that's on the lower left is probably going to break into oh, two more. Star. Whoa, where'd it go? Come back. Oh, shoot. I forgot to pause it. That's... That sky moves pretty fast. Yeah, the sky does move fast. Or rather, the sky isn't moving. The Earth's rotating. But yeah, so you have to pause it. Yeah, so there's two stars down here in the lower left in the Stellarium view, and there's one up the upper right. So these two are almost certainly going to be um, orbiting a common center of mass, and then these two and this one will be orbiting a common center of mass. This is going to be a complicated orbital dynamics here. You can go to the attic. But if we go to the attic view, the attic horizon 2 camera, reality, then we can see, whoops, reality. There it is. And <laughs> I'm just trying to zoom in. It's not going to work. Well, I can zoom in. That's pretty cool. Now, in Stellarium, they kind of have a bluish color to them. But in our view, it's kind of a more golden yeah. view. Well, sorry, I'm binning, so <laughs> hold on. Oh, you're binning. I'm binning. All right. So I'll turn the color back on. Here we go. <laughs> so there's a YouTube um, comment from Tim Thompson. Okay. Saying it's 37 degrees up there, according to the local weather station. So yeah, a little chilly. I actually splurged and purchased for the first time in my life toe warmers. So I have toe warmers, these thingies, inside my boots. Now, my toes aren't cold, although I'm not feeling any heat from these warming things. I don't know if I should. But I was very excited when I saw them. I uh, can't really tell if there's any color there or not. I'll try turning up the exposure a bit. It looks different on your monitor than it does on my monitor than it does in the YouTube feed. Yeah, well. That's as good as we get. Okay, so the question is I'm going to look for. Uh, we are looking a different direction. Oh, my goodness. We'll see if we can actually get Sky Safari to tell... Um, tell us a little about these? A little yeah, bit about well, these? Well, I'd like to know what the separation is because we are now able to split it, so... Yes. If I can find it. Beta... Come on, search. Triple star system in the constellation of Monoceros to the naked eye appears as a single star with an apparent visual magnitude of 3.74. Brightest star in the constellation. Um, doo -doo -doo, doo -doo, radial velocity, promotion. Okay, so distance. beta B and C <coughs> are 2.8 arc seconds apart. And the other one is 7.4 arc seconds away from the two. So our seeing now, at least, is comparable to about three arc seconds. Yeah, because you can resolve those two. It's gotten better. Yeah. It's not <laughs> what it was in Orion. It's, oh. Yeah, and then sometimes <laughs> it's not and so Sometimes good. it's terrible. But this is, you know, this is live astronomy, folks. Um, if you... Well, yeah, we have to contend with things. I mean, one of the reasons that the Hubble Space Telescope and the James Webb Space Telescope are so exciting for astronomers is that they're, up, they're in space above the atmosphere and they don't have this to contend with. Very exciting. That's a pretty clear shot. 
for a fraction of a second there. Okay, so all three stars are essentially B stars. Ooh, hot! B3 stars. Uh, and so the temperature's near about 18,000 Kelvin. Or, well, just about the same as degrees Celsius at that point. Um, about 3,000 times the luminosity of the sun. So about 3,000 suns worth of light coming out. Uh, the two smaller, the two ones that are closer together, they're a little bit less luminous. Uh, at about 1,600 solar, ma solar luminosities each. The age is about 34 million years. And they're about 700 light years away. Yeah. So the light that's coming into our camera tonight left those stars 700 years ago. So what was happening in the world 700 years ago? 1300s, 1321. Mm. Hang on, that was just before the Black Plague, wasn't it? 1321? <laughs> Gosh, plagues <laughs> just come in cyclically here on the Earth. Joy. But yeah, so this is Beta Monoceros. Monoceros. That? The intergalactic wanderer. You want to go to the intergalactic wanderer? Oh, the intergalactic Why wanderer. Not? Sure. Why not? Is it? Is it? Is it? Uh, when? Yes. Ah, okay. Good. The seeing is better because these are these are three arc seconds apart. Yeah, that's pretty good. So that's not bad. <laughs> so uh, we're gonna go to NGC 2419. Yep. Okay. You might um, want to prepare folks for this. <laughs> This is okay, this is so yeah, this we're is gonna, gonna be. Uh, interesting. I'm gonna prepare you for being um, somewhat underwhelmed, but once you know what we're looking at, it is so much more impressive. So we are um, gonna turn, the, turn the telescope over to a globular cluster, and so let's turn the lights on in the dome so you can see what's going on again. And I will explain what we're gonna look at. So this is NGC 2419. And this is a globular cluster with hundreds of thousands of stars. And it is very far away and very, very faint. It is um, seen uh, apparently among the stars of the constellation of Lynx, um, which is in the opposite direction to the center of the Milky Way galaxy. Um, so it is... 300,000 light years away. Now, the galaxy itself, the disk of the Milky Way, is 100,000 light years across, from side to side. We're displaced from the center. We're not at the center of the Milky Way. We're 23,000 light years from the center. But this is, so if you can see me, I'm over here on the right hand side. So here is, I'm holding my arms up and apart. Here is uh, the approximate diameter of the Milky Way. Take that diameter, multiply it three times, and if, if you think of the center of the Milky Way being where Sagittarius A star is, mass black hole, and we're off on one side, keep going in that direction, but a little bit above the plane of the Milky Way, 300,000 light years out, that is where this globular cluster is. And it was so far out that they actually thought it was not gravitationally bound to the Milky Way that it was an intergalactic globular cluster. Or maybe it was a dwarf elliptical galaxy, who knows, right? So sometimes it's hard to tell between the two. But it is in fact gravitationally bound to the Milky Way, um, although some people think it might be an intergalactic interloper coming that, you know, something that did not form when the Milky Way formed, it joined the Milky Way from intergalactic space. So this is a really impressive object. This is really, really, really far away. Um, much farther away than any of the stars of the constellation that we see as Lynx. Um, but you can think of constellations in the stars that they are made up of are, the, are kind of like windows. So windows, if you're in your house or your home and you're looking out at the universe, you're gonna look through your window. And you window over here, and window over there, window in different 
parts of the house and looking out in different directions. Um, the stars that we know of as the stars of the constellations, they're actually in space pretty darn close to us, but you can look through those stars or beyond those stars and see things that are much more distant. So the constellations, I like to think of, a, are kind of patches of the sky that you can see things both close and far. And this one is incredibly far. Um, and I wish I had an image to show you, but I do not. Ooh, I have. We could do this through maybe a FaceTime. Uh, or I could just hold it up to the webcam. That's, well, that's what I meant. <laughs> through FaceTime. FaceTime camera, I meant. Uh, let's see. So I think Chris came up with an image that shows the Milky Way and then shows the direction and distance of NGC 2419. Does it have a better name than NGC 2419? The Intergalactic Wanderer. Okay, the Intergalactic Wanderer. That's an awesome name. And what, what's, the, what's the telephone number again? NGC... 2419. Telephone number? Well, we always call it a telephone number. Search. Well, the cheat sheet here. My trusty piece of paper. 2419. In so, links. Let's see if this will work. All right. Um, oh, oops. Low Not battery. to determine true north. Well, that's okay. We don't need to know true north. Thank you. <laughs> So this is a, an app called Sky Safari, and it's not going to focus, is it? Yeah, it uh, should. So maybe if I turn the little, maybe I have to turn brightness down. Oh, it is all the way down. <laughs> OK, anyway, it shows you the galaxy. And what I'm going to do now is zoom out to where the globular cluster is located. So, so you can see these little, here on the bottom. Yeah, a little blue line going off into space. Well, we got to zoom out to see where it is. So let's see, does that show? Yeah, it's not great, but I give it a go. you try. I'm sitting right here. So here we have the Milky Way down here at the bottom. We're looking edge on, and there's the sun. And then if I pinch and zoom out, you can see <laughs> that that is where the Milky Way is there, and then NGC. 2419 is so far out. So the diameter of the Milky Way, the plane of the Milky Way is 100,000 light years, and this is 300,000 light years away, which is crazy far. But still within the halo of the Milky Way galaxy, so still part of our system. So now that you know how impressive it is, you may be more <laughs> less, <laughs> less underwhelmed the, by what you're actually uh, seeing. But they're like, what are we seeing? Should I'm, I go over to the camera view? Show them lot. just how underwhelming this is? Oh, there's something there. Hang on, let me get to the attic uh, view. See. Nope, that's not the attic view. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's there. Okay, I'm bidding too much, I think, at this point. Uh-oh. Our switcher isn't working again. Is it not? Not working. How do okay, I do this? Let me try it. Okay, so we are just looking at the dome view. Not the attic view. When in doubt, unplug and plug back in. Uh, that. Uh, I don't know. Let's see. Well, you got nothing on your. Oh, you do have something on your screen. So that's dome view. Yeah, attic view. That's interesting. That's weird. Um, What's on, what's on the screen on that side, Tom? Nothing. Oh, there's nothing on there? Yeah. Oh. Oh, okay, that's why. Uh, that, yeah, so we're actually oh, I legitimately see. okay. seeing okay. what the screen is showing, which is All right. nothing. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's something there, but we got to find a way to bring it out. So... Oh, I see some speckling. All right, 10 seconds. Here we go. Oh, a 10 second exposure rate. It's collecting a lot of light. Except we're getting a lot of scattered light, I think. But this is an object that's incredibly far away. So even if it's bright, I mean, light splow. Well, give me a second to get it. <laughs> light spreads out. Um, yeah. And you can barely see those speckles, but I think you might be able to. Or pretend you can see them. 300,000 light years away, that's 
gosh, the light from those stars left 300,000 years ago. What was happening on Earth? Let's try it. Let's try we're humans then. We're turning off some for just a bit. Okay. We have to turn off the monitors. <laughs> okay. Oh. On the red lights. Okay, we're turning off just about all the lights. I'm going to try and cover up some of these bright glowing things here on the desk. I'm going to use my hat to cover up this. Oh, there we go. Okay. It's 10 seconds. Would you like me to lower that down a bit? That's going to be painful. Let me let me bin it up and reduce the focal. Still see a star if I do this. It's just going to finish its okay, and then can you can you see the stars? Oh, I think we're zoomed in. Searching for the cluster. Searching for the cluster. Still pretty windy here. Okay, let's go back to. So, binning, I'm going to put down to four. And our exposure time. Okay, here we go, 10 seconds. And now i got to redo the levels. Oh, definitely speckling. Check on the YouTube see how it looks. Yep. See so if you can see anything. I think we can see some speckling. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So there it is. That's the furthest one I think we got. Yeah. Visible from our. Uh, Hundred and eighty two. Give or take. Some people Give say take, more. Because our take. data says three hundred thousand. Okay. It's between a hundred and eighty two and three hundred thousand light years. Again, <laughs> distances are a tricky thing in yep. astronomy. Well those are low metallicities, they should know the Oh yeah, that definitely halo. Okay, well, you know what? We can probably stand a little more. Let's see what fifteen seconds gives us. Next. You could try stacking. Oh, you could turn, you could try you stacking. Could. I don't know if it will work, but well, you've got we've got these points here, so Ooh, so. that's right. Well it's I think it needs it, it insists <laughs> on having more than you well let's just try it. Uh where is my stacking? Uh, oh we gotta be in the other view, that's why. This is preview, so we have to go over here. <laughs> uh, now I've got to go back to the right. What was I at? 15 seconds? So I'm just reading some of the YouTube comments. Um, the stars of the Beta Monoceros were only 34 million years old? There's someone who knows their astronomy, because usually yeah. you're like, they're 34 million. They're young and young and. Yeah, but that's exactly young and. Um, and apparently. The East Coast audience is what? not underwhelmed, which is lovely. <laughs> Maybe because I have, have a nice... an East Coast audience? Yes. Ooh, they're up late. Yes, they are. It's the Super Club from Anne Arundel Community College. Right. Or there we go. Okay. where thereabouts. So I'm very so pleased that you guys joined us this evening. Where is the stacking? 
And Tim Thompson says, imagine the light traveling 300,000 years, missing clouds of dust and gas, missing stars and planets, and then we get in the way. Boom. Cosmic journey hardly got started. <laughs> am I, am I missing yes, I suppose if you're going to cross the, the universe, 300,000 light years is just the beginning oh, of the stack. journey. Stack image. Okay, so we're going to try stacking. Okay. I, I suspect it's going to complain that there are not enough stars, but we'll see. Mm. Stack info. So the stars you can see around the periphery, uh, there's a couple on the left-hand side, bottom right, top right. Those are undoubtedly foreground stars. Um, I don't know for sure, but unless there's a galaxy back there and those are supernovae, then, yeah, they're going to be stars in our galaxy, which are much, much closer, but along a similar line of sight. I wonder if we can turn the cooling down. Because you can see the, the hot spots yeah. on, the, on the chip. Yeah, so the bottom and the top of this image that you're seeing right now have kind of a, a brighter glow to them. And Chris thinks that's the heat, overheating of the chip. So it is cooled. It is just air cooled, right? Le electrically cooled. Electrically cooled, this fancy camera that we have. Um, which is a fancy enough camera. It was over $1,000. So yeah, these telescope cameras. Um, so they in. have cooling, and we are trying to uh, increase the cooling. Yeah, the and I think Chris is, is playing around with some of the parameters. So we are currently stacked at 105 seconds. Ooh, 105 seconds of stacking. So as the stacking continues, it also um, helps reduce the, um, or helps increase the signal to noise ratio. Yeah, reduce. So Increase, reduce. See, now it the cold. Increases colds, the signal to noise. Yeah, increases the signal to noise ratio. So you get yeah. more signal. signal. But now I think the cold's gone to my head. Yeah, signal goes up with time, and the noise goes up with only the square root of the time. So. Ah, yes. You all end up winning. That's but. where statistics really come in handy. Well, for those who come back later in the season, when we actually have closer nearby globular <laughs> clusters, quote unquote closer, uh, then, then this will be good to compare to because it really... Believe it or not, there are seasons for looking at this. So Ooh, it's a good thing to explain. this is not the season. So is globular clusters the summer? Yeah. Because yeah. the Milky Way, so the globular clusters are above and below the plane of the Milky Way. If you go out observing, if you've ever gone out observing, you may have seen the Milky Way if you're in a nice dark location. And so that strip of the sky, you're kind of looking along the plane of the Milky Way, and you want to look 90 degrees away from that strip of the sky to look above and below the Milky Way, and that's where you're going to find the globular clusters. Now, the Milky Way is pretty high in the sky in the winter, and so the globular clusters at 90 degrees are going to be pretty close to our horizon. So winter is not a great time to look for globular clusters. But during the summer in the Northern Hemisphere, the Milky Way is pretty low toward the horizon, not on the horizon, obviously, but lower down. And the globular clusters are going to be higher up from your local horizon. So you will be able to see them more clearly. Now, we are going to be doing these live streams Oops. twice a month through the end of May. So some of you may have found the Glendale um, Planetarium webpage, which has the links to all of the upcoming um, uh, live streams. Um, but we are going to be looking, hopefully, at different objects all the time. Um, we've always chosen uh, the Tuesday closest to the first quarter moon, so we'll always have a moon to look at once a month. And then two weeks later, at third quarter moon, when the moon is not in our sky, that's when we have a really good dark sky, and we can see some more of these fainter objects. Um, right now, the moon is still a crescent moon, so it's not lighting pollute, light polluting as much, certainly, as a full moon would. But there is still quite a bit of light. But hey, let's be honest, we're just north of Los Angeles. So how many people in greater Los Angeles now? 10 million or so. Yeah, 10 million people. They all turn their lights on at night. Darn it. They all drive two cars. <laughs> yes, they all drive two cars at the same time. We need to uh, impose some of the, 
the dark sky lighting restrictions that Flagstaff, Arizona has. Um, Flagstaff, I think, is the forefront in the country for, for uh, keeping their night skies dark, which is not only good for astronomers, it's also great for migrating birds as well as nocturnal animals, and it really is just good for everything, like reducing electricity usage. All right, how are we doing? Oh, we, uh, I reset the stack because it's getting lost. Okay. It's, uh, it's... The stars are looking a little better. It's doing it. It's doing its thing, but... It's um, doing its thing. Yeah. This is, this is essentially the limit of where we, uh, where we push to. So my colleague Barbara just added to the chat in the YouTube live stream, the web page. Um, you can click on that link or just go to Glendale College Planetarium. It's a very stripped down web page to what it usually is because we don't have all the programs that we generally do. And it just has the links to all the upcoming live streams. Um, now, one question that I did want to verify with, I guess, people here, the next live stream, or sorry, the, the live stream, yeah, the next live stream in March is due to start at 7.30, but I think we did that because of the time change. But the time change is not until the 14th of March. So um, March 2nd, we could actually start at 6.30. Obviously, we have to start later and later. Does it have, well, no, 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 hold on, does it have a moon? It does not have a moon. Then we probably do not want to start too early because it won't Yeah, be that's why we started later. We did actually check all of this, was, but we're gonna have later and later start times because um, the sun sets later and later as we are moving toward the summer, but also we have the time change in the spring. So we are going to be starting the, uh, the live streams later and later, and the ones in March, we're going to start at 7.30, and April, I think, is 8 o'clock, and May is 8 o'clock. So for those of you on the East Coast, that's starting pretty late for you guys but these are archived um, they're going to be on YouTube forever I guess for until, or until we delete them so if you can't stay up late because you have class to teach the next morning for example or class to take then you are welcome to um, have a look at the live stream and then you can just um <laughs> then you can just skip over the bits where I'm just rambling on. So yes, so apparently the people on the East Coast are already okay. pushing zombification. I think we're good. Are we good? Okay. Oh, we're turning yeah. lights on? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, so okay. we can probably turn the screen back on. And I'm going to put my hat back on my head because, oh my gosh, it's cold without my hat. Oop, I better turn the camera down. Because this is going to get... What's that? It's warm in here compared to outside. Oh, it's, yeah, it's still, still pretty cold here. I had to leave the beginning of the day. Yeah, put it on the zone Yep. There we go. Ooh, it's getting cold. Well, it is cold. So I guess Jessica and I are going to go. Yep, we were waiting for another astronomer to show that. So are we going to another object, or do you want to end the evening with a tour of downstairs? Well, so I thought we, would, we were going to go to the uh, Clown Face Nebula next. Okay. And that would be our last object, and then we can look at the mirror underneath, maybe. Okay. Close it up. It's already 7.45. Yeah. Did you look at Perseus Double Cluster? No, we did not. That is a good question. The double Cluster YouTube. is is going to was too big. But Perseus. <laughs> oh, yeah, with our... Cam well, right. Our camera has such a narrow field of view that we can't see it because the Perseus double cluster is too big. With an eyepiece, you can see that, but not with the camera that we are right. using. Uh, kill the lights. All right, so we're gonna kill the lights. We're gonna go back to a view through the telescope. Um, what are we looking at? Uh, I'm still stuck on the other object, so I'm just gonna oh. reset all the settings. So while you're resetting all the settings, we can go and have a look at Stellarium again, this lovely software package. And for those of you who may want to get it for yourself, you can go to stellarium.org. There is a browser version that you can use, um, but I would recommend downloading it because the, 
the free download is much more robust than um, what is available in the browser. You can also purchase it as an app. I think it's ten, around $10, nine ninety nine. Um, but if you download it to your laptop or your desktop, it is free. And it is open source, so you get astronomers adding more information and upgrading it. And you can change location. Um, the default location is the original programmer's grandparents' farm in rural France. So you can see kind of a barn in the background. It's lovely. I don't know if there are cows there as well. But we are looking at the night sky. Oh, got to change the time. 7.47. There we go. And we have Orion. And let's put some of the artwork back on that's so uh, what's going on? interesting. I think Stellarium does have different... And I'll have to look. I'll see if I'll do this for next next time because you can fi configure it so that the artwork that is shown is not the Greco-Roman constellation artwork. It is artwork from other sky cultures, yeah, which I think would be amazing. Because that is something that is, uh, I think, needs to be talked about by astronomers more because certainly it's not the, okay. just the Greeks and the Romans that told Actually, stories about the groupings of stars there, in the night yeah, sky. The Australian Aboriginals had, well, they're amazing astronomers and they told lots of stories of uh, the North American um, First Nations individuals told amazing stories. Um, there is a series of online conferences I found. The next one I think is, oh my gosh. Um, what's it called? It's called Native Sky Watchers, a web page I found. And it's got, the next live event is February 26th. And it's funded in conjunction with NASA. And it's called Two-Eyed Seeing. And that is kind of a concept of one eye, you're looking with the native cultures oh, and their stories, okay. and kind of the other eye with the scientific understanding of what you're looking at. And the next one is African Indigenous Astronomy okay. and NASA Moon to Mars. So they're going to be talking about the moon and the stories Ooh, presented by the West African country of right, I'm bring uh, the, Benin, exposure down the twin and gods for the sun and the moon from the Fon people of that nation. Just focus maybe so, more. some indigenous uh, um, astronomy, which is pretty cool. And star stories. Now, we're just about there. you're just about there. It's stopped updating again. Oh. Ugh. Software. So, well, you know what? You can look at what we what we got okay. last. It's not Ooh. live, but. <laughs> Ta-da! So, what are we looking at again? Clown face nebula. The clown face nebula. Which was also once known as the Eskimo nebula, but it, then was. That was. Uh, officially, renamed. Or, yes. Or not not renamed, but officially, it was no longer named. It was considered no longer appropriate to call it the Eskimo Nebula. Um, this is the Clown Face Nebula. Personally, I'm not seeing a clown's face, but I do see that double ring that we saw a little bit of with Cleopatra's Eye Nebula. Again, this is a planetary nebula. That bright object at the center will be a white dwarf, although I think it's not, I think that's pretty much blown out with the bad seeing. It is. So uh, we're gonna try and do this again. Um, do you want to unplug it and plug it in again? So our camera is misbehaving. So this uh, nebula is too dim to see without the help of a telescope. The first person to see it, to our knowledge, with a telescope was William Herschel, who discovered so many things back in the late 1700s. Let's try five seconds. Ah, da, 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 da. Um, it is a double shell 
Because of its double shell morphology, this nebula was nicknamed either the uh, Eskimo, now known as Inuit, or Clown Face Nebula. It resembles a person's head surrounded by a parka hood. One more time. Which, again, not really seeing, but that's what they believed a few hundred years ago. Visual magnitude of 9.1, which means it's very faint. We can see down to a visual magnitude of 6. So if you think, uh, if you want to know uh, about visual magnitude Caesar. or apparent magnitude, the first, the brightest stars are kind of first class stars, like Sirius here, or since nothing is coming through there, so Sirius, Rigel, um, Capella, those are kind of first class stars. And then second class stars, magnitude two, okay. are fainter. And then third class stars, magnitude three, fainter still. And we can see the very faintest stars, um, we can see to sixth magnitude. And the Cloud Face Nebula is down to ninth magnitude, 9.1 actually. Oh. It's about That's 300 light years away. Uh, uh, okay, hold on. And there you go. You can Google the uh, image and get the Hubble Space Telescope image, which is really it, impressive. Yeah, and it's not updating, it's just um, uh, giving you the same. But let me see what we are looking at with the attic view. It's, it's misbehaving, it's not happy. Oh, the camera's misbehaving. Oh, whoa. Yes, yes, the camera is misbehaving. Okay. So when in doubt, All unplug. Right. I'm out. Here and then plug out. back in. Okay. All right. <laughs> and now, of course, I gotta find a USB plug in the dark. <laughs> Bought it. Yeah. So I'm just reading some of the. Uh, Thank you. The YouTube right. chat chatter. <laughs> Telescope and dome are 113 years old, so they're feeling a little squeaky. For some reason, it always wants to go back to 15 seconds. Does it? Yeah. I may need to restart the. Uh, the Temple of Science. This doesn't work. Yeah, I have to say, I love being in this dome, and the hundred inch. Okay. They're just. Gave me nothing. Yeah, my happy place. <sighs> okay, I'm gonna quit the software. Unplug. <laughs> now we have a snorkeler, right. <laughs> which I think is a desktop image. You're plugged in? Okay. Got it. So I think we have anything in the dome view. Oh, now we've lost the dome view. Not the webcam view. <laughs> People are clustering cold. around so I put my None mask back on. want to work in the cold anymore. Whoa. Yep, I think we're... Right. <laughs> I think we we're let's, getting really cold here. Let's see what happens. Well, we could finish on this note, because there's only six minutes left. Yeah, I mean, I, we might just have to, because we're, it's not, it is not coming back. It oh is, my goodness. It's not, yeah, it just... It's decided oh, sorry, it's done the, for the evening, the I think. <laughs> a combination of our camera and our software. It says it's taking images, but we're getting nothing on the histogram, so it's not showing any data coming in. Huh. We know it's on. We have to get a computer up there. I think that, that will I think that's probably make it better. Yep. We're going to get a Raspberry Pi and put it right on the or telescope itself. Probably a PC. Or a small PC, small PC and just things. plunk it right on the telescope itself. So we have so much technology up here. It's actually kind of fun. It's been a really it's interesting cool. learning it's, experience it's, it's, it's to figure out how to do with, all of this but, and then live stream to yeah, YouTube. Uh, frustrating at times, but fun. It's amazing what you could do. Um, anyway. If we're not getting anything, you want to turn the lights back on? Yeah, I'll get the lights back on. And then we will just say goodnight to everone. Do I show up? Yep. So I'm just going to take well, this off for a moment and say thank you so much for joining us this evening. 
I hope you've had fun here at the Mount Wilson Observatory um, and the 60-inch dome. On behalf of myself, Jenny Krestov, Chris Burns, my husband, um, Tom Mendigini, <laughs> who's behind you me, say and Richard Bell, who are um, Mount Wilson people. Along, everyone. Yay! Um, we are going to say good night, and maybe we'll see you again in a couple of weeks. Good night. That's interesting. I thought that was me that.